on here. So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. The next step would be, of course, to, to kind of put this model into Lingo and see how that is done. In order to do that, we need to know a little bit more than we know already. We need to know how to define binary variables in Lingo. That is, of course, a necessity. If the system doesn't know that a, 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 a variable is binary, there's nothing that kind of... So we have to give specific instructions on defining binary variables. And that's basically the only difference. But um, let's uh, kind of return to the example and kind of write out the model frame in the example to see how it is, okay? In our example, there were no production costs, okay? So that part is taken out of the model. We don't need that last part of the objective. We can rule that out. Kt was equal to 132 for all t. So it was fixed. And the same with the inventory cost. It was 0 0.6 for all t. A few words about this mt, okay? As I said in the previous hour, the mt should be a big number. So you need it to be big enough in the sense that uh, the, this constraint, when you have a big number there, actually doesn't constrain the variables uh, more than necessary. So there is actually a point here in these models to try to make this big m as small as possible, but still big enough to work as it should. Do you see what I mean? And of course, in this case, we know, in a sense, the span of the production volume, don't we? We have our demand numbers, and we know that in the first period, either we produce for the first, or the first and the second, and so on. So the maximum amount we can produce in the first period is the aggregate or the sum of all future demands, isn't it? That is the maximum amount we can produce in the first. So M1 could be equal the total aggregate demand value. Just add together all the demands to produce M1. M2 could be slightly smaller, couldn't it? Because then we have kind of finished in the first period and then it's only the remaining demands which are relevant. And of course in the final period you will, you will never produce more than the demand amount for that period. So this M, they kind of start at the big level and move down. That is the most efficient M's you can have in this kind of model. And the reason for efficiency here is that if you have these constraints, which are kind of too loose, then you risk searching in wrong areas. You can see this, okay? If you kind of have a space which is too big and you kind of search through it, it's better to kind of narrow it down. You can, you can compare this that you're looking for a missed person, okay? And if you know that that person is missing in Africa, then there's a lot of search to do, isn't it? But you, if you can restrict it to Zambia, then there's less searching if you can uh, restrict it to the capital of Zambia, which is <laughs> Lusaka, then it's even less space to ser search, okay? And this is the point here. So we try to, when we use these big M's, to make them as small as possible without violating the logic. And in this case, it's easy to do it. In other cases, it's not that easy. In some cases, you may, you may even formulate and solve another optimization problem to actually find the most efficient big M's. And this could be actually very important when it comes to solution speed. So, so we can kind of say that M1 should equal the sum from T equals 1 to 
How many pairs did we have? I don't remember. M2 could equal the sum from 10 equals 2 to t of dt, and so on, to make it very fine-tuned. But if we are a bit lazy, okay, let's be a bit lazy now and just use this one as our, for all t, laziness. Okay, it, it doesn't really matter. This problem is so small that we don't see any effect on of course, then we are secure. So if we, we stick to a, a constant m and use the, the, the sum of all the mod numbers, that would be appropriate to secure logic in any period. And this is 439, I seem to recall. Okay, let's try to look at uh, our model here, what it looks like. Okay, we start with the objective and we have this 132 times delta 1 plus 132 times delta 2. And we keep on with this up to 10 variables. It was 10 demand numbers in our example. Let me see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Yeah, this was correct. And then we have to add this inventory part, 0 0.6 times I1 plus 0 0.6 times I2 and so on, up to the final one. We don't have any constraints given in this example on how much to have in inventory. And of course, then we typically will, no, will, will not have any inventory when we when finish because that will produce extra unnecessary costs. And our optimization will fix that for us. Then we have this inventory balance constraints. I1 should equal I0 plus X1 minus the demand in the first period, which was 42. And this one is assumed zero in the example. We didn't have any initial inventory in this example you recall from yesterday. So we end up here, if you want to write it slightly different, I like as always to put all the variables on the left hand side and the constants on the right hand side and I rearrange here, put that one there and that one there, I get x1 minus i1 equals 42. That is the first constraint you have to put in here for the inventory part and then you will get x2 uh -huh. It's better to do it like this, I think. I remove this a little bit to the left, then I get, sorry, this should be x1, shouldn't it? x1, yes. So, then I move to x2, something happens in between here, minus i2 should equal the second demand number, which also was 42, if you recall the numbers. And we have to add i1 here, the previous inventory uh, carried over. And now we can just increase the subscripts here as we move down here. So we get uh, x3 plus i2 minus i3 equals the third numbers which was 32 and then it moves on all the way down to the final one which is number 10. x10 plus i nine then perhaps minus i 10 equals the final one which was 38 so there is actually one two three six missing in between here now okay i didn't write them to. it's just filling in this and just copying increasing the subscript down here and then uh, this is the inventory balance constraints and of course we need these big m constraints which secures the logic so uh, it looks like this, x t less than or equal to m t times delta t. Starting with 1, x1 should be less than or equal to m t, which could be 439 times delta 1, x2 less than or equal to 439 times delta 2, and so on. They are just similar. Times delta 3. So this is the direct content in the lingo model. Okay, you write it in. Of course, you have to write, use some, you can't use Greek letters, I think, so you should perhaps use delta with words or whatever you like. Uh, and uh, you can use D if you like. Uh, 
all these 10, all these 10, and you have finally to specify that these delta variables should be binary, and you need to know how to do that, okay? So let's have a look at this example. It is available on the front end. Now, if you don't know this, you can of course search the help function of Lingo to look for binary variables, and you'll probably find the answer. Or alternatively, you can listen to me and I can tell you how to do this. Okay. Both options are straightforward. And of course, this varies from in between different optimization program packages. The actual syntax, as we say, the, the way to tell the program that we deal with binary variables are different between different program packages. So, let us have a look. We'll take Let me turn this one down here. And we move up one level to look at added material. There's, some, there's a file here called... Uh, mm -hmm. Lotsize.lg4. That is the one here. So let's download it. Save as on desktop perhaps to make it easy. And then we have to start Lingo. Uh, I had, uh, uh, yeah. Hopefully you are able to start Lingo now in various ways. Yeah. Uh, you recall that it, it's, it's now standardly installed on the student computers here. So each time you log in on the student, student computer, there is a kind of icon for Lingo. So you can start it without actually installing it on your own computer. So you don't really need to bother with that if you, if you don't want to do it. I have it somewhere else. Uh, I have to go on a network disk here where it is. This is only my access, so you can't start this one. But it doesn't matter. So I open this file from the desktop. And here you can see at the top here, there is 132 times. I use D here, D1 plus D2 and had all, all the way up to D10. And then there's plus 0 0.6 times I1, I2, and so on, which is the same as uh, we saw on the board. And we always stop with a semicolon as normal. And now I did something I shouldn't do. Hmm. And we can do it like this. Okay. And here we start the inventory balance constraints. X1 minus I1 equals 42. It's the first one. X2 plus I1 minus I2 equals 42, and so on. So here are all 10 written in the first segment here. And here you have the logical constraints to force I, or so, sorry, delta or D to be either 1 or zero, 0, depending on if there is production or not. And here you see the syntax to define binary variables. You use the, uh, this character, what do you call it in English? What do you call this character, this, uh, which is in the email addresses? At, at, yeah, at, yeah, okay. So you use that character and you write bin with large letters and a parenthesis and, and you put the variable inside and you end with the semicolon. No, I see, you see I have defined all these Ds to be binary variables. And of course the, the non-negativity claims for X and I is kind of, in this case the model doesn't have X, it's actually only I are automatically taken care of. Yeah, sorry, there are x's as well here, of course. There are x's here, but there are no x's in the objective anymore because the cost was, was zero. We need to have the x's in the model to kind of be able to know when these deltas should be one or zero. So the next step is then straightforward to just solve by uh, clicking this uh, target. And you see here you get some information on the model again. There is the number of variables, which are 30. And uh, there is no nonlinear variables, but there are 10 integers. So they, they use the term integer here instead of binary. This is somewhat misleading, but uh, uh, the, the point is that, of course, a binary variable is a kind of a special integer variable. It could be whole numbers, 
So it's possible here to kind of use integer variables as well. But the integer variables as such are not very important in, in these kind of, of theory. So we have constraints here. It's totally 21. That seems reasonable. We have 10 inventory balance equations, 10 logical ones for the binaries, and an objective. So that's 10 plus 10 plus 1, which is 21. And these non-zeros is, is something we didn't discuss, and we don't plan to discuss it uh, either. So you don't need to care about that. And here you, here you see the solution. You see the objective value is 610.20. Do you remember the best solution from Silver and Mill? Was 650 something, wasn't it? Yes, 650.4. 650.4. Okay, so you see we don't get such a big leap now. We move from 650 down to 610. That would be 40. Let me try to calculate. 10 percent is 60. 5 percent is 30. Yeah, it's uh, something in between 5 and 10 percent then. Reduction in cost. So it works, but of course you don't get this big leap. So in general this tells an important story in the sense that this silver and mill heuristic normally works very well if you have quite big variations in demand. If you have very small variations in demand, then the EOQ works very well. In fact, if you have constant demand, the EOQ heuristic produces the optimal solution, as expected, because it assumes that demand is constant, and if demand is constant, then using that formula is, is actually correct at least if the number of time periods are large. And now you can see uh, our pr production schedule here. We have a setup in period one. Of course, we must have that. When there's no initial inventory, we'll, we will always have to produce in the first period when we have this, uh, this type of model. And that could, of course, be used in an intelligent way of doing this, okay? because we know that we must have a positive production in period one, actually, which means that delta one must always be one. Okay? We have to produce in the first period. We know that before we start. So we could have kind of utilized that, putting delta 1 equal to 1, and that would maybe help us in solving faster. But if you, if you look at the solution time here, it is actually extremely small. It's not even measurable here either. You can see that. So you might ask, what is this crazy Hegelian talking about? Uh, of course, you don't see it yet. Hopefully, we will see it later on when we move to some more complex problems that you act it actually takes time to solve this. The problem with this software we have is that we cannot expand it. It has a limited amount of variables, so it's, it's harder to kind of see the real cases where it really takes time. So in the case, we need a kind of professional version here, which costs a lot of money. So yeah. you, have to, you just have to believe me. So there's a, a production in period one, and that one produces for one, two, three, four, and five. If you recall the silver and meal, I think it produced for four. So we, we produce slightly longer now in the first period in the optimal solution. Then we produce this again in six and then in nine. So there are three setups here, which was the same as in the silver and meal solution. So the setup cost is the same. So the, we, we then have to save this extra 40 on, on inventory uh, adjustments. And, and that's what's happening here. So if we should try to sum this up. We have looked at a naive heuristic, the lot for lot heuristic on this problem. We looked at the EOQ approximation. We looked at the silver and mill heuristic. And finally, we looked at an optimal solution. And uh, of course, these values of these solutions, they kind of went or moved in the, the correct direction. We started out with 1320, 13, ended up with 610. From 610 to 1320, it's a big step, isn't it? That is more than 100% decrease in cost, which is, of course, substantial. But uh, you should be aware of the fact that, of course, this is a constructed example. And the mix between the setup cost and the inventory cost, plus the somewhat special demand pattern here, makes it work like this. So in many practical cases, you will not see these big uh, improvements when uh, going through the different heuristics. So you should take this example as an example, that kind of shows how it runs, uh, but basically not much more than that. Okay. 
Uh, I said to yesterday that we will run through exercise two uh, on the uh, on the coming Monday. Of course, at this point, we have learned enough to also do exercise three. Uh, but I think we leave that for the week after. Okay, it's it's enough to look at number two first now, and, and exercise three is related to these matters here. So the idea then is to look doing this and make some changes in the model, maybe some other logic, this kind of stuff. Okay, so you, you know, you're able to try it. Our next subject is moving back into the inventory part. You, you recall from yesterday that I kind of started up slightly in chapter four, maybe it was, or maybe it was chapter three, I don't remember. Let me have a look at the textbook. Yeah, we finished chapter three, and then I, I discussed, um, I kind of took the basic uh, EOQ model from chapter four, and we discussed how kind of to, to use that in production. That was kind of what we're talking about today. Uh, now we'll move back into chapter five. Uh, next week, talking about inventory control subject to uncertain demand. So now we will kind of look at at least one model, which is very important in uh, event planning, it's often referred to as the newsboy or news vendor model. Have you heard about that? No. It has a very naive and nice story. It's this newsboy. He goes around on the street selling newspapers, okay? And uh, he has to buy these newspapers before he sells them. And uh, there's many different versions of this problem. The simplest one is that he, he buys this newspaper at a given price and he sells them at a given price. Of course, there must be a difference here. To, to give some profit to the newsboy. Uh, but uh, the newsboy, he doesn't know really how many newspapers he are able to sell every day. So there are a certain uncertainty here. He has some probabilistic knowledge. So we could say, on average, I sell 10 papers. Some days I sell five, others I sell 15. And the question fr from the newsboy's point of view is, how many papers should he buy? Based on the knowledge of this differential between the selling price and the buying price. And there is also, in many cases, opened up for the possibility of returning the newspapers, either at a zero price or at a certain symbolic price. So you can buy a lot of newspapers, go out and sell a part and take the rest and go back to the news agent and say, OK, I get this left. How much do you give me? So this is the simplest version. And there's a lot of versions. There's the so-called so pricing newsboy model, where the newsboy also has the option of defining his own price. Now, now he buys the newspapers at a given price, but he can also decide on what price to sell for. Of course, then, presumably or assumably, we assume that there's a link here. So if, it, if he sets a very high price, he sells less. But it's still uncertainty. Okay? Then it becomes kind of complex. And we can move it further on to look at newsboy games. It could be two or three newsboys competing on selling papers. So there's a whole pile of these newsboy problems. In many cases, you could say that the newsboy problem is the mother of all stochastic optimization problems. And if you think about the story I've told you now, it should not be very hard to link it into the event setting. Okay? In the event setting, we kind of buy a volume of something. We could buy a volume of artists, for instance, for the Molde Festival. We don't really know how many tickets we sell. That we have some knowledge on the average, on the variance or, or the distribution. And again, the question is what artists to book and how many to book, which is very close to this newsboy situation. So this is a kind of a one period inventory problem. Okay? You need to decide how much to, to, to buy in a given period. And you cannot, cannot store it to the next day. Of course, you know newspapers, they don't sell the day after. At least not at a reasonable price. So. Uh, so, so this is the topic we will discuss next week. Okay, and when we finish that, we move into chapter b b b um, eight, I think. Operations scheduling, which is sequencing stuff, making the right sequence of stuff. It's it's an important part, which may be important also in events. Okay, how to sequence various artists, for instance. Should you have the best artist early or the best artist late? Should you have the best artist in between? This is not obvious, is it? So we look into these matters. How should you sequence a football league? Is it good to have teams who are kind of close to each other on the table 
playing against each other, or should it be the vice, the, the other way around, to try to maximize the audience, for instance. So these kind of matters will be uh, kind of the final topic in this first part of the course. And when we finish that, we move on to, to this other book. Okay? Then I don't have anything else today, so I think we stop. Because I have to go to Ørsta. <laughs> and Waldo. Okay? okay? Have a nice uh, day, have a nice week.